Your Creative Push, Episode 141. You have to be very self-secure. You have to have maturity. But once you do, it's the most freeing thing in the world. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Linda Blondheim. Linda is a landscape painter whose mission is to visually record the rural agricultural lands and trees of her beloved Florida. She believes that painters are stewards of our history and culture who record the experiences and lives of our own time, and her legacy as a painter is to leave a visual record of the beauty of Florida. And Linda, first of all, thank you so much for coming on the show. I have to ask, though, why such a love for Florida? Well, I'm a native, so that's the main reason. I just love my state, and I was born and raised and on farms and ranches, and it's uh, a great, great life. Excellent. Um, Linda, I was wondering, could you take us back to your first or maybe one of your first creative moments and, and to tell us that story? Sure. I became interested in art when I was about eight years old. I organized a neighborhood painting club. We used to sit on my front porch and draw and paint animals and nature. My parents were blue-collar careerists, but they found room in their budget to get me some private art lessons. Hmm. At 13, my dad made a studio for me in the attic where I dreamed of being a famous artist. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I still dream that, by the way. Good. Well, that that dream should never go. That's right. I knew what I wanted to do, and so I established a pretty good work ethic. Uh, While my buddies were out cruising in muscle cars, I was upstairs painting every day. (laughs) Well, that's safer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. My parents liked it, too. Yeah, but well, you said they were careerists. So, uh, yeah. w- was there any resistance from them to you know take on you know painting as a, a profession? Well, there was. I mean, they you know they got me art lessons. They took me to museums as a kid, and they thought that was just great, you know. Mm-hmm. Until I got college age and announced that I was going to art school, and then the resistance <laughs> started. <laughs> Sure. They were not thrilled by that. My dad wanted me to be an attorney, so <laughs> um, it it didn't work out too well for him. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out well for you. It did. It truly did. Now, uh, you mentioned resistances. Are, are there any resistances that you um, kind of experience today, like on a daily basis when you're trying to, you know, get the work done? Well, not not so much today. When I was... A younger artist after art school, uh, I had some difficulties, uh, lack of confidence. I wasn't one of those painters with natural ability. I'm legally blind in one eye, so I had to overcome some physical inabilities as well to be a painter. That's not a great thing to have when you're a painter, hmm. you know. So I had to work really hard and... Uh, I never had that natural ability. Uh, I didn't learn a whole lot in art school other than the basics of various mediums. And I didn't really come to understand painting until I was really in my 40s. What was the moment then that you said you, you figured it out in your 40s? What was like the moment where you really felt like you, I guess, got it? (laughs) For one thing, I learned how to mix color. I think that was a a really strong uh, change for me. You know, I had been in the art school years taught to just throw lots of color on canvas and call it perfect, you know. (laughs) (laughs) So I learned, I actually learned harmony and and, uh, color harmony when I got a bit older and studied longer. I think that was a big change for me. Uh, going from, you know, primary colors to developing a little more subtlety in my palette. That was a big help. And you mentioned uh, lack of confidence, which I think 
is just a recurring theme, you know, and it's it's almost reassuring to hear it from almost everybody. There's this, this lack of confidence. I think that everybody kind of has that. And I, I was just wondering how you were able to kind of get past that. Well, I, I think uh, that unerring determination is, is the key to overcome any kind of resistance. Uh, I have a strong will and I never accept in any way that I might be a failure. Um, at this stage of life, I can't imagine doing any other job, so I won't allow myself to fail. The key is uh, resistance to failure, is flexibility, uh, being willing to learn, throwing away the hubris of youth, you know, when, when I actually thought I knew something. <laughs> Like others, I would rather paint than sell, but I know that's not possible. So I had to take on the art of marketing as a necessary part of being a painter. Uh, I try to be flexible. I keep a keen eye on business and the economy. Uh, I always paint what I like, but I change sizes to motivate beginning collectors and and uh, so I'm flexible uh, with, you know, in terms of recession or, or or upswings in the economy. I think you have to be in any business. And painting, just like anything else, is a business. And, you know, young kids coming out of art school say, oh, no, that's terrible. That's, you know, heresy. But the fact is I can't paint if I don't sell paintings. So, mm. you know. You have to be a realist about these things. Absolutely. Unerring determination. I love that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> w- w- would you say you have any, uh, like, one or two, like, really um, strong tips for uh, the business aspect of it? I do. I think uh, that you have to understand your collector base, really, because they're the person who keeps you alive and, and who becomes your your dearest friend. Um, mm-hmm. So a, a lot of problems for uh, artists is they have this tendency to uh, bundle up together in groups and in their uh, social connections. Everybody wants to spend time with other artists, and I think that's a big mistake. Most of my collectors are not artists, and they have nothing to do with the art world. Uh, but they do love uh, nature, farms and ranches. You know, a lot of my collectors are farmers because that's what I paint. I paint their land and right. and trees. And so in my particular case, you know, many of my friends are, are not artists, though I know thousands of them. But uh, that's a big problem because... You know, artists want to feel safe and hang around with their own kind, and and I think that's a mistake. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so how do you start to find that collector base to find the the, the customers for somebody that's just kind of starting out and does not have right. uh, has not kind of found that you know audience per se? Right. Well, your audience are the people who love what you paint. And mm. that sounds simplistic, but it's it's quite <laughs> true. You know, if you are mm-hmm. a floral painter, then you need to get to know gardeners and and people who who love botanical ba- gardens and garden clubs and uh, plant nurseries and those kinds of things. They're the people who are your collectors. And in my case, it's people who love uh, you know land trust people and and. Uh, uh, Water management people and and uh, farmers and ranchers they're they're my collectors because they understand my work they know what I'm doing so uh, you know if whatever if you if you like to paint uh, cars then you need to get to know people at car shows and that's what I meant by getting out into the community not hanging around with artists playing safe. Right. It's like a kind of incestuous, like, and and for a lot of people, they can just, you know, find a niche that nobody really exists in, you know, and, and become that person for them. Like people who would never think to really, 
you know, buy art, you know, find those people and just impress them with your work. And that's and- right. Yeah, it, it it's really not what what uh, beginning artists think in terms of marketing because. My collectors, uh, most of my collectors never set foot in an art gallery. They don't go to openings. They don't go to museum openings. You know, they don't do that. That's not right. their world. And so, you know, by attending every opening and going to all the gallery shows, you, you think you're going to get somewhere. Perhaps not. You know, it depends on what you pay. Right. You're just a small fish in a big pond doing that, but you can kind of create your own pond or your own lake, your own ocean by, you know, creating it essentially is what you're saying. Yeah. And there has to be an authenticity about being an artist. That That's really very important that you believe in what you paint, that you live it, that you understand it. Uh, and it shows. There are thousands of people who tell me you know, wow, you really understand old Florida, natural Florida, you really get it. And I do because it's my life. So, you know, that's, I, I couldn't go out where you live and paint and, and have the same feel to my work because I know nothing about it. Right. And like you, you've kind of developed that kind of expertise, like we were talking about with like the niche, like you are an authority figure when you're you know, painting that over and over again or doing whatever over and over again. Uh, so it's it really is kind of de- creating your own. Yes. There's just thousands of Florida painters, as you probably know. And, you know, most of them paint boat marinas and Key West and, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, mm-hmm. sea oats and that kind of stuff. And that's great. But, you know, I needed to find the part of Florida that that really spoke to me. So being a tree painter and and land and field painter is is something that's a bit different from most Florida painters, you know. So it worked very well for me as as a niche. Yeah, and then and you get to paint what you love too. It's like it's the perfect kind of recipe. <laughs> It truly is. I I think there uh, are paintings for everyone. You just have to find people who identify with with you and your work, who who have that commonality. Mm, absolutely. And it, and it's not always the obvious art collector. You know, I had a, a one of my biggest collectors at one time was my uh, pest control man. <laughs> who owned the business, and he loved my paintings. He had probably ten of them. So, you know, you just don't know where that collector's coming from. Could you take us back to your your worst moment or maybe your hardest time, uh, specifically having to do with kind of your creativity and with resistance? Yes. Uh, I would say my most difficult period as an artist was raising my children. I went through an ugly divorce when I was pregnant with my second Mm -hmm. daughter and faced really hard financial times for about 15 years. I had to go to work as a chef and do art festivals on weekends. And I was a single mom. It, It was a really difficult period. But the The thing is, I never stopped practicing and working, you know, on my art, even though I had another uh, job in those years. Um, The thing is, you cannot give up. If you really believe that you were meant to be a painter or whatever Mm -hmm. artist, you really can't say, well, I, you know, I just don't have time. I can't do it anymore. I mean, if, if nothing else, I would paint for, you know, start at midnight and paint mm. for an hour. So uh, that's a big mistake that a lot of folks make. They, they, Their life takes a turn for the worse. They have to go to work and they say, well, it's over. Well, it's not over. It's only temporary, mm. you know. And so you never stop preparing yourself for your mission. And I think that's an important lesson because everybody's going to have a hard time as an artist sooner or later. Right. It's not uh, like a perfect linear path. I think everybody has those dips in, in life 
And, uh, you know, a lot of people do have these, these long gaps. And if, you know, if you have had a long gap, it, it's okay to get back to it. Nobody's going to be mad at you. But yeah, it's, it's using art as like a, a way to kind of get through those bad times and then not give it up. You're right. Absolutely. And the thing is that, you know, if you can't afford paint, you can get pencils and paper and you can improve your drawing skills every single day, no matter how many other jobs you have. And that is the mistake so many artists make. If they go back to work or have to work and can't do art full time like I do, then, you know, they just give up and you cannot do that. You have to be working all the time. And, and if it's nothing but drawing on copy paper with a number two pencil, you're improving your chances when, you're, when your time arrives. Absolutely. It's that unerring determination. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, but well, how about a happier moment? How about a, your best or most triumphant creative moment? Well, I think every day is the best moment for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> I work as a full-time artist. My kids are grown and I have complete control over my time and resources. And so, you know, my schedule is my own. I've gotten over the hubris of my youth. I no longer do competitive art. My concern is for my work and the collectors who support me. And so, you know, I've, I've let all of that uh, ego stuff go. You know, I don't have to prove anything anymore. I've been around forever. So uh, that once you let go of your ego and you really just work as a painter, it's the best thing in the world. You, you know, it takes all of that pressure off, and and I do better work now than than I ever did. So it, it, every day is the best for me. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and it it is it's tough to let go of the ego, but you know, piece by piece, try to just mm -hmm. let it go. Yeah, it takes a long time to be able to do that. You have to be very self secure as a painter, not to worry about what somebody else is doing or if they're. You know, if they're going to win a prize and you're not, you have to have maturity to overcome mm -hmm. that. But once you do, it's the most freeing thing in the world. Hmm. Do you have a uh, formula for balancing your time? Yes. I am a person of routine. Uh, I'm very self-disciplined. Mm. I work at marketing and correspondence from 9 to 11 every day. I work in the studio from 11 to 2. I go back in the studio from 4 to 5, and on Wednesday and Saturday, I meet and greet friends and collectors at my retail studio in the city. Uh, twice a year, I go on residencies for a week, and those are sponsored by my collectors. They give me their vacation homes mm. in beautiful places. <laughs> That's awesome. You got it figured out, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. So um, as a full-time artist, then, what, what would you say that your art and creativity brings to your life? Well, I can't imagine not being a painter. It's the lifeblood and purpose for me. You know, I'm very mission-oriented. I've, I've always felt that that we need to have a purpose in our lives to, you know, to the good. Um, it sustained mm -hmm. me through the worst and best times of my life. It gives me independence from obligation and at the same time allows me to be supportive to other artists. Uh, I'll never have to retire and, you know, hope for some other purpose because I can paint till I drop dead. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> well, when you put it that way. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, that's the goal, right? That's the goal. That's right. That's right. Um, I was wondering, do you have a, a greatest inspiration or like a favorite book or anything else that you draw inspiration from that maybe we could too? Sure. Uh, I'm very inspired by the uh, living painter, Daniel Green. He lives in New York City, and he is a living master. Mm. Um, he, he is fantastic. Uh, I love John Singer Sargent's work, too. Uh, I'm really inspired by all the people I know who have positive attitudes and who are determined to create a better world 
So those mm. are my inspirations. I like positive people. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so important, you know, I, I say it all the time on the podcast to surround yourself with, you know, positive people or people that are um, on the same page either the same path as you or ahead of you on the path or just like really determined, like you said, uh, to kind of create change rather than people that are kind of, you know, chilling out <laughs> and being stagnant, you know, and, and not trying to make some sort of positive benefit to, to the world. I so agree with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Linda, this has been awesome, uh, but it's time for the final push. This is where I ask you to reach through the microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best words of advice and really push them to pursue their creative passions. Okay. Uh, my best advice to any emerging artist is to have self-confidence and mm. self-discipline. They need to become and remain lifetime students. Uh, study every day and put time in front of the easel every day. Learn how to be flexible and to enjoy marketing your work. Don't hide in the artistic community. Get out in the world of other careers and interests. Meet people who you will enjoy commonalities with outside of the art community. They're your collectors and friends who will support you. Get yourself a business mentor and listen to their advice. Plan a path and work toward achieving your goals every single day and be a good note taker. I love it. That's a lot, but it's yeah, uh, it's it all important, you know. <laughs> we can uh, we can take from your knowledge and I really do uh, appreciate that that idea of, you know, kind of going out and and finding uh, your own audience, your own collectors and not going into where everybody else already is, you know. Uh, it's almost a recipe for disaster or for failure. Yes, indeed. Uh, Linda, thank you uh, so much for coming on the show today and for giving us that push. Thank you, Youngman. It was my pleasure. Uh, and you can find Linda on her website, which is lindablondheim.com. That's L-I-N-D-A-B-L-O-N-D-H-E-I-M. Uh, or on Facebook, she is lindablondheim.art. Uh, or you can find everything we talked about today at yourcreativepush.com slash lindablondheim. Linda, thank you again. Thank you, young man. And there you have it, my interview with Linda. I think there's a lot of great things to take from this episode um, from somebody who has been doing this successfully for a really long time. I think she has really great advice there about finding your own niche, about finding your own clients and not jumping in that large, you know, pool of other artists where all the other artists hang out, the predictable places, the galleries, the shows, um, where art connoisseurs are coming to potentially buy your work. And this really goes for all creative types. It's about finding that unique audience that's going to connect with your work in a way that they haven't been connected with art or creativity ever before. Perhaps it makes them think about new things that they haven't thought about before, but even better, perhaps it makes them realize that they are not the only ones that think about the things that they think about. And your way of expressing yourself with the things that you love is a way for them to have a genuine, true expression for themselves uh, through you, through your art, through the thing that you do. It's about finding that personal connection with people as opposed to like an artistic connection with people. If you can find that kind of an audience that isn't necessarily looking for art, that isn't looking for a creative expression, but is super happy to go along uh, with your ride, with your uh, way of expressing yourself about the things that you love and that they also love. I don't know. That's like a connection that is very rare. And what I want you to do after this episode is take five minutes, take 10 minutes, take an hour and just sit and think about how you can do this for yourself. How can you push your work out there to an audience that isn't necessarily looking for it? How can you find that? Think about that. Really think hard, think creatively and think outside the box. You can be a kind of pioneer, you know? And the beauty of, of that is that you get to set the rules. You don't have to uh, abide by anybody else's standards. You don't have to go down a path that anybody else has already gone down. 
to prove the concept. You can do it yourself. You can be a trailblazer. That's one of the things that um, was really important for me about this podcast is to try to interview, um, well, really interview anybody that can inspire other people, but to find people that haven't ever been on a podcast or been interviewed or even thought about it. And to also find people to listen to the podcast that aren't already listening to podcasts. It'd be super easy to find people that have already been interviewed on other podcasts, to find an audience that is already listening to other podcasts about creativity. But then what is that really adding? You know, what is that adding to to the world, to the creative community? That's not really my mission. My mission is to try to find new voices to contribute. And that's why it's so fun to find somebody like Linda Um, who's been doing this for a while and who has like key pieces of advice that you should definitely pay attention to. You know, it's been over 140 episodes now, and I think only one other person had mentioned that, uh, Mitch Bowler back in episode 102. And it's amazing that with so many different voices coming from so many different disciplines, there's so many of the same fears, but there's also new advice almost every day that makes you stop and think. And, uh, I think that this is something really important that you should definitely think about. It's finding that new niche. It's finding that new audience. And I want you to take some steps this week to not only think about it, but maybe shoot out a couple emails or put yourself out there in a, in a few different ways to try to start blazing your own trail. But that's all I've got for you today. Hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. Have that unerring determination and go out today, go out tomorrow. Keep doing it every single day, uh, and we will see you on Wednesday if you need the push again. Love you all, and we will see you then. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.